interesting things about triangles. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Um, Thank you, Dr. Z. All right, so today I'm going to be talking to you guys about, well, I guess the title would be a quantitative local limit theorem for triangles in the random graph. So let me first talk about sort of what I what do I mean and the difference between a you guys are probably familiar with this idea of a central limit theorem, which says that things sort of look like a bell curve in a sort of broad way. So here's a picture of a sort of a central limit theorem. So I this is actually a plot that I made for triangles in a random graph. And this is a sort of central limit data. Each one of these blocks represents a, maybe I think it's about some fraction, maybe it's like a tenth of a standard deviation or whatever it is. And so you can sort of see the probability of lying in this wide swath of space. And if you plot it, you get this very nice thing that looks exactly like the bell curve somewhat closely. And so that's kind of a central limit theorem. We'll talk about that more. So a local limit theorem is a little bit more fine-grained. Here we see zero is the expectation. And this negative 50 means differing by the expectation by exactly 50. So if the expectation were 100, this would be saying that you got 50 triangles. This would be saying you had exactly 150 triangles. And so the local limit theorem would be looking at this data point-wise. Uh, and you can see here, it still looks like a normal curve. It's just a lot messier because there's a lot more points. All right. That's what I needed that for. <laughs> So let's start at the very beginning of the story. We're going to be working in the erdos renyi random graph. I'll probably show it again. So the erdos renyi random graph, G U N P. And so you guys probably know what this is, but let me just remind you. So this is the graph. This is a random graph, random object. It's a graph with n vertices. And each edge is present with probability p independently. And so this is a random object. Of course, it's not a fixed object. I could draw you an example. Anything I draw will be an example. So, I'm going to, so here, there we go. That's something in G of 4P for any P. All right. Not no, here. Yes. Yeah. 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 You have me there. All right. So what we're going to be looking at, for the most part, is we're going to be taking a look at the random variable P. So it is T. We define T, so technically it, it takes in the edge set of your graph. And what does it do? All right, it's the number of triangles, which I will forever write like this. The number of triangles in your random graph. So this is a random variable. Yeah. And in particular, it's going to be on the probability space of edges, which we're going to sort of look at as negative 1, 1 to the end choose two. Just the natural numbers, in fact. All right, um, I have in my notes here an example. So let's do it, but you won't feel enlightened. So you guys will understand already. So this is a graph, and how many triangles are in the graph? <laughs> what is it? it two? two? Yeah, I think it's two. All right. So you have this triangle and this triangle and nothing else. All right, so that's the basics. And so the question is that we're going to be asking, we'll have sort of two questions. One is, how does this random variable behave as we hold p fixed? So think of p as a constant. In fact, for the entire talk, it will be one half. Just to simplify, we'll gain a lot of simplicity in notation and lose no generality. So we're going to take p to be fixed at a half. 
and we're going to take n to infinity. And the question is, how does t, t behave? And so now, question two, we won't talk about so much, but it's what's kind of lurking in the back of my head, which is the follow-up question, all right, how does the number of h's behave as n goes to infinity, where h, in this case, is an arbitrary subgraph. So you could ask the same question, not for triangles, but for squares, pentagrams, um, What's the Knazer graphs? I don't know, whatever you want there. And you could ask the same question, and so in some ways these questions are very old and very well studied, and in at least one way they are not. So no, no, that's important, because otherwise I'd have nothing to say. Uh, so let me talk about the history, because I would be very remiss if I didn't mention that this property has a lot of his this, this This count has a lot of history, there's been a lot of really good work done, and I will so remind you of some of the basics. So. In, so we have Erdős and Rennyi. Is, is there an accent I'm missing on Rennyi? Because I never. I know. Yeah, there's one. There's one. On the E, I guess. On the E? What? 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 Like that positive flow? Yeah, that one. Yeah, that. No. I guess. Yeah. <laughs> okay, good. And so this one goes back to 1960. So they looked at this. This is, I think, the first sort of random graph, or the, one of the earliest important random graph papers, and already they did work on this. And so what they showed was they showed that t is concentrated about its mean. And in fact, if they take the case that we're not going to take, if you have p small, which we're taking p to be a fixed constant, but they're taking p to be something maybe like 1 over n, then they showed that t is, is Poisson. So already in the very first paper, they proved a central limit theorem, of, well, not a central limit, a Poisson, I guess, limit theorem for triangles in the very first paper that random graphs were ever studied. So these have a history. All right, let's go forward a little bit to the 80s, and people started proving central limit theorems. And so... I'm not going to cite a lot of these works individually, just for time reason, but I'm going to list some of the names that I would have cited, and so we have work here. I'm sure I'll be missing quite a few people. There's specific papers I would have cited were Barbour, Janssen, uh, Svant Janssen, Baronsky, Nowicki, and Ryszynski, and I'll talk about what they did. And so what they did was they showed a central limit theorem. And this is a statement of the following form for t. So they showed that the limit as n goes to infinity of the probability that t is in, so I'll define some of these symbols in a moment. that t lies at some interval, uh, mu is the mean, sigma is the standard deviation, so some interval of length, a multiple of the standard deviation, approaches exactly what you might expect from the normal, which is this. Right. So, right, so this is just the normal density function, and this is saying the probability that you lie between a deviations from the mean and B deviations from the mean is exactly the same thing you would get from the normal. So right, if you draw the picture, here's the normal density. So this will be mu. This will be, say, say we normalize it to have expectation 0. If A is over here, B is over here. So A would maybe be negative 1. B might be positive 1. The probability that T differs by the mean is, you know, is between 1 A deviation below to B deviations above here is exactly this interval, this area under the bell curve. So that's a central limit theorem type result in that we have some big interval. Uh, 
Let me tell you what sigma is. Here mu is the expectation of t, which is just p cubed times n choose 3. Sigma is the variance of t. And so in this case, it has a bit of a more complicated form that I'll write down later, but it's something that looks like O of n to the fourth. And so the basic thing is that, uh, oh, sorry, that's sigma squared. And so the point is that you get, if you give me an interval of length about n squared, I can tell you the probability that your number of triangles lies in that interval using a central limit theorem. All right. And so this is, you know, sort of what you want to prove for random variables. You get a good limiting distribution, a very nice limiting distribution. And I want to single out, uh, I think there's a paper by Janssen and Nowicki. So these ones I want to mention. This one I want to mention explicitly. So Janssen and Nowicki in 92 uh, gave another proof of this that had already been proved in 88 by Ryshinsky that this triangles and other graphs had these central limit theorems. But they gave a proof, and I want to mention it because it's very, very similar to mine. And I found this out later. Uh, I, they, do, they get different results, and they state it in an entirely different language. But the core ideas under the proof are very similar. So I just want to mention it. And so they build it off of giving this, uh, I guess you might call it sort of a, I think this is the right term. It's a generalized Walsh basis. Is that the right term? And so that's going to be very similar to what I end up doing, and so I want to mention it and say, give them credit for doing something very similar first. All right. Now let me talk about what's new and how we do it. So there's one more past paper that I have to mention for local limit theorems, and this is Gilmer and Cardi. Yes. Talked about in this room, yeah. Uh, about, I guess two years ago now. And so what they proved was the following statement. Speaking of Gilmer, what happened to him? He's in New York doing data sciences. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I did mention this to him, but he couldn't make it down. So, all right. The probability that uh, the the random variable t is equal to k. So notice, well, I'll talk about the difference in a second. Is one over the square root of two pi sigma. Here we have e to the negative k minus mu squared over 2 sigma squared plus little o of 1 over sigma. All right. And so this is a local limit theorem. So why do I call this a local limit theorem? Because the data that you're getting is very, very precise. You're not getting the probability that t lies in some interval. You're telling me the exact probability of, well, you're estimating for me the probability that t is exactly some number. So for example, so if k is really far from the mean, you can verify this is actually fairly meaningless. But if, t if k is like exactly the mean, then you get that the probability that the number of triangles is exactly the nearest integer to the expected value is about 1 over square root of 2 pi times the standard deviation. So you can get sort of very fine-grained information. And again, just to contrast that again to the central limit theorem up there, in which you need to ask me when t lies in some interval of length n squared. All right. So that's the distinction. And this is the kind of result that we're going to talk about today. And I guess I should state what I'm doing. It does the local limit imply the central limit? Not directly, no. So if you were to take, so the proof, yes, the proof is a stronger statement. 
but from this statement alone, you, you couldn't get it, right? Because if you were to try and add up this yeah. term for everything in the interval, this error would grow to be much larger than the value we're interested in. However, if you go through the proof that we do, you could pull out a quantitative central limit theorem proof at any point you wanted, just not out of the end result. And I'll mention that point when we get to it. I'll say, ah, this would be a central limit theorem now. All right. So now let me just, I'm going to go ahead and make my modest contribution here. 16-ish, uh, I guess. I don't know. Uh, it still has to be posted. And the gain uh, is this. We take this sigma, and we add an n to the 0.5 minus epsilon to it for any epsilon. All right, and so this doesn't look like much of a change, but I do want to emphasize that it, it makes, I think, at least a bigger difference than you might expect, and the reason is that before the error term was 1 over sigma, which was exactly the size of the main term. Now, it was little o, so it went to 0, and you did get, and of course you got your local limit theorem, and it was great, but this one will, say, give you some bound on how good it is. You actually get something like 1 over root n. You know that you're within that much, or... Sorry, I guess in this case it would be 1 over n to the 2.5 of the actual value. So you can actually use this to get sort of statistical distance results that you couldn't before. So quantitatively, this gives us some room. Here we were right up against it for the, you know, the error term and the main term, and this gives us some breathing room to find some applications. Uh, and is that as good as you can do? Is it sharp? It is not. So, so... Sharp in what sense? So the best you could do would be the following. So I guess optimal error would be something that looked like this. 1 over a sigma sort of poly of n. And I think that this poly of n is maybe something like, I think the best you could do would be something like, I want to say that, but I'm not positive off the top of my head. And so you could, and I, uh, I don't mean, well, it's, it might be the best possible. This is like the best you could ever hope for, for some silly reason. Uh, this is the best that I could prove, and maybe it's the truth. I, and that's part of the question, is I have really no idea how to ascertain whether this is the truth or not. What is your experiment? It's a little hard to read. Oh, oh. Went to the what? Point 0.5 minus, uh, maybe if I write it like, uh, yeah. N to the 1 half minus epsilon. Okay, where epsilon is any arbitrary constant that you like it to be, you pay for it a little bit in the constant. I think the constant is something like 1 over epsilon. All right. Okay. So that's the statement. Uh, are there any questions about the statement? Maybe I should leave the definition of T up there. So what are the tools that we're going to need? So that was the result. That was the history. So I'm going to talk for a little bit about how we got here and what kind of tools we needed. All right. So the first one that we're going to need is the characteristic function of a random variable. This is a classical object. And so what is this? So let's take x to be a random variable. Right? This will be a review. So x to a random variable. And then the characteristic function of x. And so you define this as follows.